Right. Yeah, you pulled it off anyways, you know. It didn't, it didn't show that the song leader, the, the page flipper and the congregations were all doing different things. It all kind of just, you know, it all. <laughs> Praise God, amen. All right, let's open our Bibles, please, to Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52, and we'll be, uh, we'll be taking a look at that uh, in a moment. Isaiah 52. This evening I'd like uh, for us to look at and to marvel at an amazing passage of Scripture. I mean, they're all amazing, obviously, but this is truly an amazing passage of Scripture. It is found, as I said, in the book of Isaiah, and it is considered to be one of the closest descriptions and prophecies of Jesus' person and His work contained in all of the Old Testament. This passage is commonly referred to as the suffering servant passage in Isaiah because it pictures the Messiah of Israel not as a conquering political hero as many of the people thought he might be at the time, but as one who would save his people through suffering. That's the key, remember that idea, that the Messiah would save his people through suffering suffering, not through conquest. It is an amazing passage because of its accuracy in describing the person, the purpose, and the promise of God fulfilled through Jesus Christ, and all of it foretold some 700 years before His appearance, seven centuries before His appearance. It is amazing because the information contained in this passage could not be applied historically or morally or theologically to any other religious leader in history except Jesus Christ. That's how specific it is. Only He could be the suffering servant. So this lesson is a, a, a little bit different in that the lesson is not going to be three ways to do this, five things to avoid, you know, those type of lessons. This evening the purpose of the lesson is to marvel, to be amazed as we examine the miraculous prophecy concerning Jesus, the suffering servant, as he is described by Isaiah the prophet. Maybe I need to give you just a little bit of background about Isaiah himself. He lived in the seventh and sixth century before Christ. Um, after Solomon died, we know from history that the kingdom of Israel was divided into the northern and the southern kingdoms. Each kingdom had its own leaders and prophets. And Isaiah was a prophet in the southern kingdom living in Jerusalem. We know that he was an educated man and he came from a leading family and so he served the kings in the court of the king as a minister of sorts. You know, in those days prophets served Jewish kings as religious and political advisors since its leaders sought the will of God in what they did as kings and so it was natural that the prophets would serve the kings directly, as I said, as a, as a counselor. Uh, now, this doesn't mean that they always agreed. Uh, there was often a source of conflict because many of the kings didn't want to follow the word of the prophets uh, when they received it. They recognized, oh, this is a prophet and this man is talking to me from God, but I don't like what he's saying to me, so I'm not going to do it. And that sounds familiar, isn't it? That's human nature, right? In this capacity, Isaiah lived and served through the reigns of several kings in Jerusalem. The Talmud, which is an ancient Jewish writing with historical information and commentaries, the Talmud claims that Isaiah was sawn in two by evil king Manasseh for prophesying unfavorable things. And there's even a reference made to him uh, obliquely, but in Hebrews chapter 11, you know, the great chapter on the heroes of the faith, and they talk about 
Some were sawn in two, and many scholars believe that that reference is to Isaiah, who was executed by King Manasseh, and that is the way that he was executed. Now during his lifetime, Isaiah saw the northern kingdom destroyed and the Assyrian army, which conquered the north, marched right to the gates of Jerusalem itself. He had advised King Hezekiah not to surrender and he prayed for the city and an angel stopped the foreign army and saved the city. And that was the high point of his ministry. His writings are a commentary on the things that took place in his own lifetime, but he also prophesied about future events. For example, the fall of the northern kingdom. He prophesied about that event. Uh, the rise of the Babylonian empire, a hundred years before it actually happened. Isaiah spoke of that. Uh, the decline of Egypt as a world power. Um, the uh, eventual fall of Jerusalem and its restoration under King Cyrus, who wasn't even born when Isaiah made that prophecy. Just the amazing things that Isaiah wrote about. Now aside from his predictions, Isaiah also spoke of the spiritual condition of the nation and its role in the world. And it is here where the image of the suffering servant comes in. Isaiah described the nation of Israel as God's servant, who at times suffered because of its relationship to God, but would one day be vindicated, one day would be restored from its captivity. So, so don't get me wrong, Isaiah did speak about the nation of Israel as a nation that suffered. It's not that all the references to suffering were only about the Messiah to come. Sometimes, however, he described the servant as a person, a man, who would come to serve God for a very special purpose. And so in chapters 49 to 55, Isaiah speaks about this idea of the servant, the individual. Sometimes it's the nation and sometimes it's the individual and the context is what decides which individual, whether it's the individual or the nation that he's talking about. However, in chapters 52 and 53, Isaiah talks about the servant as a person, and what is amazing is that he gives a perfect account of Jesus' life and ministry here on earth. Now in the past, you know, I've, I've done a, a study with you showing you know, why is the Bible re reliable. I've, I've done sermons and classes you know, discussing the idea of the inspiration of Scripture and so on and so forth. And one of the reasons we say the Bible is reliable is because it contains fulfilled prophecy. Somebody says to me, why do you believe the Bible is the word of God? What's so special about it? You know? Well, the very first thing I tell them is that, well, I believe that the Bible is God's word because it is inspired by God. It's a special book. There are a lot of holy books around. You can find a lot of holy books and a lot of religious books. But the Bible is a book that is written by God. God used men to write what is in the Bible. That's why I believe what I believe concerning the scriptures. So um, Isaiah 52 and 53 contain one of the clearest examples of this fulfilled prophecy that I'm talking about. Not simply the predictions of political events you know, in the next 50 or 100 years, but an accurate description of the Christ 700 years before He arrived. Accurate in every way. Accurately describing His person. I mean, the description that Isaiah gives could not fit any other person in history in general or in Jewish history. Only Jesus could fulfill what Isaiah writes about in Isaiah 52 and 3 accurately describing his purpose, in other words, the purpose of the Messiah, the heart and soul of the Christian religion, the reason for Christ's work is described in Isaiah. And thirdly, accurately describing the promise made. Um, though Isaiah, or through Isaiah, rather, God provided the encouragement that sinners needed long before the Christ arrived. You know, people back then, knew that they were sinners. 
and needed encouragement that one day there would be a solution. And Isaiah describes the solution that God would provide to take care of the sins of men. So let's go through the text and see Jesus as the suffering servant described by Isaiah. So we we'll go to chapter 52 and we'll begin in verse 13. He says, Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted, just as many were astonished at you, my people. So his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. So here Isaiah distinguishes between the idea of the nation as servant and the Messiah as servant. Even though the nation has suffered, Isaiah says, the suffering of this particular individual will be great. He immediately identifies this person as a servant and as a servant who will suffer. And this is where the idea of the suffering servant passage comes from. You know, we refer to this as the suffering servant. You wonder, who coined that phrase? Where does that come from? Well, it comes from the word itself. It comes from Isaiah uh, uh, himself. He's the one that describes this individual as a suffering servant. We move on to verse 15. It says, thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what he had not been told, them they will see. And what they had not heard, they will understand. So this verse here reveals the purpose of the Messiah's ministry, and that is to cleanse. You know, the priest in the Old Testament would sprinkle the people with the blood of the sacrifice signifying that the sacrifice covered their sins. They were covered with the blood of the sacrifice and this represented their cleansing from the moral filth that they, that they had because of sin. So notice here he talks about the sprinkling, not of the people, but the sprinkling of the nations. The sprinkling of the nations is a reference to the idea that the sacrifice of this Messiah would accomplish this, not only for the people in the physical presence of the priest, which was the case with the, the Jews, but for the entire world as well, the sprinkling of all the nations. Even powerful men like kings will be amazed, Isaiah says, because God's plan for saving man by cleansing him from sin will finally be revealed through this particular servant. You know, Paul talks about this mystery revealed in Romans chapter 16, verse 25. What mystery? What mystery is being revealed? How and why God is, is providing a way to cleanse not only the Jewish nation, but the entire world of sin, and then to make of one these two, uh, these two groups. And so we move on to verse, uh, chapter 53, and he says in verse one, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So here Isaiah writes as God would himself be speaking in the first person. So he kind of puts words, if you wish, in the mouth of God. God is doing the speaking here in verse one. And God is saying that despite the things that the Messiah would do, there would be disbelief. The prophecy here is that the reaction to what the servant would do would be disbelief and history confirms that despite the miracles and despite the teaching and despite the, the life that no one could challenge for sinfulness in any way, despite all of this, the Jews first and later the world largely disbelieved. And so once Isaiah states this, he goes on to describe the person of the servant. So he's talked about the purpose, the sprinkling of the nations, the response he would get, you know, mostly disbelief. Now in verse two and three, he talks about the person of the servant himself. He says, for he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. And so what's Isaiah saying in just ordinary language? 
Well, he grew like a plain plant, not in a royal garden, you know, without any special care. This Messiah, the servant. Of course, this refers to the humble birth of Jesus, who although he was king, chose to be born in a manger with poor people and not in a palace with kings. His early years were not spent as a king in splendor with attention being paid to him, but rather in obscurity, living under the submission of his parents. In his later life, during his public ministry, we know that he spent much of it avoiding the crowds who merely wanted bread, avoiding the religious leaders who wanted to trap him and kill him because they despised him. His final night was spent alone in anguished prayer and his last days a long ordeal of suffering and rejection and painful death and throughout his life attacked by Satan, attacked by the people, abandoned even by his own disciples. He didn't live a life you know, of luxury and ease. He wasn't, quote, a popular speaker. He was popular, people followed him but they were quick to abandon him. Isaiah continues his description. He says, surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. I mean, it takes your breath away to read that passage of scripture and to know that it was written seven centuries before, before Christ. In these verses, Isaiah explains the purpose of Jesus' life and death and resurrection. In three short verses are contained the core of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I can imagine you know, when you hear about the apostles or Apollos or somebody in the New Testament you know, pointing to the idea and proving to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. Of course, they didn't have the New Testament. You know, I mean, written. Uh, you wonder, well, where did they preach from? What scriptures were they referring to? What were they holding up to these Jewish people to, to prove to them that this Jesus Christ, he's the Messiah, where do you think he went? Where do you, what passages of scripture do you think that they quoted to convince them of this? You know, I, I submit to you that perhaps not only this, but that this passage here was a very, very powerful piece of scripture uh, that made a part of their defense, a part of their, of their argument. Most of the Old Testament is written in poetic form and Isaiah is no exception. Now one poetic device used was to repeat the same idea in a variety of ways. It's called parallelism. That's the literary device. And in many of the, especially in the Psalms, for example, you see the psalmist, you know, they, take a, they, they have one idea and they repeat it in a different way you know, two or three times, called parallelism. Well, here Isaiah explains that the Messiah would die for the sins of men, and he explains it in three ways. First, he says, he would carry our sorrow. Now, some would think that it was his, his sadness or his sins that he was on the cross for, the way that it's written. But the truth of the matter was that it was our suffering and it was our sins that we see in his cross and in his death, not his own. So that's one way he explains it. Then he says that he would experience the pain. You know, he was pierced, he was crushed, he was chastened, he was scourged. You know. What do they mean crushed? I mean, they didn't crush him. They didn't drop a stone on Jesus. You know, I mean, it says none of his bones were broken. You know, what, what do they mean crushed? Well, I, I don't believe he's talking about bones here. You know, one of the things that the Romans did when they executed you, they didn't just kill your body. They didn't do that. They first killed your spirit. 
They first crushed your person. They crushed your hope. When you read about the, 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 the passion, you know, the, the suffering of Jesus, realize how much psychological suffering uh, that, they, that they imposed on Him before they finally killed Him uh, on the cross. Uh, uh, to, to mock Him in front of others, to beat Him in front of others, to spit on Him and slap Him and, and do all those things, to, to, to know that there was no hope, to, to, to parade Him around naked. You know, all the pictures of the cross we see, you know, Jesus is wearing you know, some sort of loincloth, some sort of, they didn't, they didn't do that. The final humiliation, you, know, you were crucified in public and naked, nothing. That's what they're talking about. They crushed a person's spirit before they killed him. And that's what they're talking about here. Crushing him, crushing his psychology, crushing his uh, uh, sense of self, crushing his humanity before, they, before they, they took his life. So Isaiah said he, was, he would experience this this piercing, this crushing, this chastening, this humility, this scourging that we should experience when God would judge and condemn us. Death, condemnation from God, these things cause pain and the Messiah would experience that pain on behalf of each person so that when they came before God, they would not have to. And I shouldn't say they, I should say we would not have to. He suffered the pain that comes from being separated from God so that we would not have to suffer that pain. So that's the second way. He describes the same thing. And then the third way, he says, he will bring those who are lost back home again by suffering the consequences of their lostness on their, on their behalf. You hear when they say you know, all of the things that were supposed to fall on us, fell on him. That's a, the third way he described. All the things that happen to those who stray away from God, the Messiah will bear all of these things so that they can go home to be with God. Jesus, the apostles, and every person who has ever tried to preach the good news of salvation has repeated this idea to his hearers. I mean, that's, isn't that the good news, the gospel? Jesus suffering for our sins. I mean, that's in a short sentence. We're so familiar with it because we've heard it, you know, those of us who, you know, those of you who have grown up in the church, those who have been Christians for a while, you've heard that message over and over and over so many times. But imagine that the, this message compressed into three simple verses, perfectly reflecting what the gospel would be preached 700 years later contained in the passage of Isaiah. I mean, I, I just marvel at these things. And I wonder what were people thinking, like his contemporaries who lived at that time, when they were reading this, what were they thinking? Who could this refer to? How does this work? The mystery that people scratched their heads. The eunuch reading in his chariot. What was he reading? Isaiah. Who's he talking about? Who he, who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus. And then in verse seven, keeps going, it says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. His mouth. So in verse seven, Isaiah returns to describe the spirit with which the Messiah would enter into all of this suffering. Unlike the nation, and you know, I've had this discussion with individuals who are Jewish, and they, you know, they claim you know, the Messiah is the nation of Israel. You know, through their suffering throughout the years, you know, they're the ones that bear the suffering you know, for the whole world. They, they, you know, they claim Isaiah is only talking about the nation of Israel. But how could, how could the nation of Israel be reflected in this last passage in verse seven? It says you know, that he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was silent. 
You know, unlike the nation who suffered because of its rebellion and did not bear its punishment willingly and without complaint, if you have read the Old Testament lately, you know that God punished the Jewish nation, but He didn't punish them for doing what was good. He punished them because of infidelity, adultery, spiritual adultery, because of their sins. And how exactly did they react to that chastening? They weren't quiet about it. They weren't accepting of it. No, they rebelled. They didn't like it. They fought back. They disobeyed. But the individual servant, the Messiah, Isaiah said, would accept his suffering without complaint, without resistance. His suffering was due not for his own sins, but as a command of God for the sins of others. And for this reason, he bore it quietly and without resistance. For to resist was to resist God. To refuse was to lose man's opportunity for salvation. Anytime I feel I'm being put upon, anytime I feel that, well, it's just not fair the way I'm treated, I deserve better, people ought not to treat me that way, yada, blah, 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 blah. You know, I just go over to Isaiah 52 and 53 and I read this passage and it's enough to close my mouth, close my mouth. Because at least whatever I'm suffering, I'm suffering it for me. <laughs> you know, for what I've done. But the Lord Jesus Christ suffered for what we did and accepted it quietly. In verse eight, Isaiah continues, he says, by oppression and judgment he was taken away and as for his who, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgressions of my people to whom the stroke was due. Here's another poetic device. After describing the person and the purpose of the servant, the author, God, asks a question of the readers. Once the Messiah was unjustly killed and taken away, who among his own generation or people realized that it was for their own sins that this has happened and not for his own? Once again, the idea of disbelief and misunderstanding is brought up. The Jews did not believe he was the Messiah and rejected the idea that his death was for their sins. Again, I've had a Jewish person once, we were having a discussion, just come right out and tell me, you know what, just flat out, said, you know what, I don't need anybody to die for my sins. I said, really? Yes. I said, why? Because I obey the commandments. Okay. They actually, they said this with a straight face. Because I obey the commandments, I don't need anybody to pay for my sins because I don't owe anything. I keep the, what, what, it was a woman, what she meant was, yeah, I keep the Sabbath, I, you know what I'm saying, uh, during the holidays, uh, I don't eat pork, you know, I keep the commandments. I'm not saying that every Jewish person thinks like that, but this particular one did. And of course, they considered him a blasphemer and a troublemaker until the, very, until the very end. He was on the cross already and they were still pointing at him and laughing at him. Oh, come on down, hey, troublemaker. Hey, going to destroy the temple? See, <laughs> you know. What do you say now, big shot? Even, even in his suffering, they didn't cut him any slack. And to this day, they don't believe and they reject him. What's ironic is um, that the number two uh, industry in uh, Israel uh, is tourism. And so the, the number one industry is uh, diamond processing. But the number two industry is tourism. Imagine uh, 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 an entire nation that rejects the notion that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, right? but requires the tourist money that pours into the country in order to visit Christian you know, sites. It's just, it's crazy. You know, it's hard to get it all into your brain when you, when you think about it. And yet as Isaiah is saying, they're not going to accept. 
they're going to continue to deny. In verse 9 he says, um, his grave was assigned with the wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit found in his mouth. Wow, that really blows my mind. Never mind how he died, why he died, what the circumstances, even how he is buried. <laughs> the details of his burial, come on. The writer says that even in death he would be justified. You see, evil men, criminals, they were buried in common graves. They were cut off from their people. But even though Jesus was considered this by the people and by the Romans, he would be buried in a proper grave. We know that Jesus was removed from the cross by Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, and he was buried in a new tomb near the place where he died, and not in a common grave. We read about that in John chapter 19. I mean, think about it. He, the detail about the fact that he would not be buried among criminals, but that he would have a proper burial of a just man. And so even though he died like a criminal, he was buried like a just man. And in the last verses of Isaiah's passage here, the promise or the result of the Messiah's suffering is explained. Again, this is explained in different ways. So we read verse 10 and it says, but the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. The servant will live to see his descendants those who will come after him. God's will will be done through him. In other words, the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. God is going to have his will executed, fulfilled through this servant. Verse 11, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, and he will bear their iniquities. Again, there's the gospel, You're just in two lines. The servant, through his suffering, will live to see the justification, meaning the forgiveness and the salvation of those who will come after him. There is a very specific uh, statement concerning the result of what this suffering servant will do. A, a, a clear and exact theological statement about salvation and how it will be achieved. And then in verse 12 it says, Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many, and interceded for the transgressors. Isaiah says that he will be considered great because of his work as atoning sacrifice, and the mediator between God and his servants. In other words, because of his suffering, the servant will save many, and will himself live to see these that he has saved, and will be exalted by God. Now he's even making reference to the ascension. I mean, everything to do with the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension, even the ascension, all of it referred to clearly, theologically, absolutely clearly, seven centuries before. And you know, there was a time when people said, well, I say, you know, it, was, it was written during the time of Jesus. You know, it's, it's a fake thing. You know, how, it can't be accurate. You know, that was the argument. Oh, oh oops, oh, until 1947 when they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh-oh, trouble. <laughs> what did they happen to find in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, they found the scrolls of Isaiah, not written in 100 or 200, but written long before I mean, a copy of, written during the time of Jesus anyways. 
and even before the time of Jesus. And what did it say? Well, it said exactly this. I remember speaking to one of the scholars and he said, you, if you could read Hebrew, if you could read the scroll and you had your English, you know, New American Standard or King James or whatever, and you had the scroll there and you had the thing there and you read it, it's the same thing. What they were reading in the first century is the same thing, as far as Isaiah is concerned, the same thing that we're reading today in the, in the, in the 21st century. So poof, went the argument was, well, it was written in the second century, they were writing, you know, looking back. No. no. If you only had one prophecy, just one, if this was the only one that we had, we've got hundreds of others, but if we only had one, it would be enough to make the case for the inspiration of the Bible. In this passage, Written 700 years before the appearance of the Messiah, Isaiah describes perfectly three things that we now know about the Christ Jesus. One, his personality. This description of his attitude, how he was perceived, how he was treated, and how he reacted could not fit any other Jewish character or any other religious leader throughout history. No one else fits this profile except Jesus Christ. No one else. Number two, Isaiah describes the Messiah's purpose. The doctrine of salvation by substitutionary atonement is perfectly explained here. He explains why God is doing this 700 years before God actually does it. And what is he saying? Not animal sacrifice, is necessary for atonement, but the willing sacrifice of God's own chosen servant on behalf of all sinners. This is the basis of Christianity. No other religion has this as a central feature. In every other major religion, do you know who takes care of sin? You do. It's on you to take care of your sin. You either make a pilgrimage or you deny yourself something or you wear a hat. Or, you know, I often say the great thing about Christianity, no dress code. <laughs> no dress code in Christianity. Every other religion, you take care of your own sins. That's how you do it, by following certain rituals or doing some certain thing or whatever, but you take care of the sins. Christianity is the only religion where God takes care of our sins. And Isaiah describes perfectly how God has done this long before he did it. In the passage, Isaiah describes the promise that God makes to the Messiah and to those who will benefit from his appearance. A, to the Messiah, the promise is that death will not be able to hold him because he is sinless. The empty grave and witness of the apostles confirmed this. The angels are witnesses that he is at the right hand of God. And to uh, those who accept him, they receive the promise that their sins will be forgiven and that the punishment that they would have to endure forever has fallen on him. As marvelous as it is, Isaiah's prophecy could only describe what a person could look forward to, what could hope for in the future. And that's if you actually understood it all. You know that God would become a human being and offer His own life for the sins of man. Who, who could conceive such a thing? While He lived, they had only the sacrifice of animals to appease their consciences for sin. And this only reminded them of sin. It did not cleanse them of their guilty consciences. I ask you, brothers and sisters, can you imagine living like that? Knowing that your sins are there. You know, we, we take so lightly the idea that, that for, as far as God is concerned for us Christians, our sins are as far as east is from west, means you know, they're, they're gone. We have that great luxury of going to bed at night and, and thinking and finishing up our day with some prayer, a moment, a thought. And we can actually say, thank you God for accepting me. Thank you for looking at me and not seeing all the ugliness that I see. We can say that sincerely. They couldn't say that. 
We, on the other hand, have the blessing of having seen this prophecy fulfilled and having access to the sacrifice of the Messiah to wash away our sins, to guarantee our salvation, and to protect us against the judgment to come. What he, through the miracle of prophecy, saw, we, through the word of God, have access to today. The opportunity to be saved through Jesus Christ. So if you understand and if you believe Isaiah's prophecy, and if you have a need for forgiveness, understand that it is there, waiting for you. I'm looking here, and you know, Sunday night's pretty much, it's us, right? <laughs> pretty much us. Had a lot of visitors this morning, not wonderful, having our families here, and some, you know, some folks don't come as often to worship. So great to see them. Heard such a great message, such an uplifting worship service this morning, you know? But Sunday night, it's us, right? But even us, even us, we need to be assured that we're okay with God, even us. And isn't it wonderful that God, 700 years before He actually did it, prepared the people to understand His plan. And so today and tonight, if you're a brother or a sister and you have need of prayer, encouragement, to believe, to hang on to, to grasp that forgiveness, and you're, you're, you know, you're, your knees are a little weak, your hands are a little shaky, you know, and you need the encouragement of the church, the elders are here to talk to you, encourage you, encourage you, to take advantage of that ministry. And if someone is here who has not yet after all this preaching, after all this teaching, who has not yet confessed their faith in Christ and been buried in the waters of baptism, if you haven't done that yet, please, I beg you, don't, don't put it off. Do it today, do it tonight.